Hello and welcome to Food for the Journey, a weekly program of St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Aberdeen, Maryland. I'm Pastor Robert Blessard, and every week we get together in order to explore some aspect of our faith that we might have inspiration, encouragement, strength, companionship, food, for the spiritual journey that we are all making as disciples of Jesus Christ. It is Wednesday, the 16th of March, 2022, and we are in the season of Lent. That's the, that season between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday that Christians have traditionally uh, endeavored to draw closer to God through faith practices like fasting and almsgiving and special works and devotion, and especially prayer. With that in mind, I'm using the season of Lent for this, uh, this program to explore the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, of course, is the most common of all the prayers in Christianity uh, for good reason. Jesus himself gave us the words of the Lord's Prayer, um, gospel, the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 6 uh, records Jesus' words, giving us the Lord's Prayer, and Luke does the same thing in chapter 11. The words are really important. Our spiritual forebear, Martin Luther, looked at the Lord's Prayer and as he meditated on it, as he prayed it, as he asked God to show him the deeper meanings, he discovered that the Lord's Prayer really was a paradigm prayer. It, it is not only the, the form, the matrix, the paradigm for all Christian prayer, but also is kind of a key to, gives us the key to our spiritual walk. Last week we looked at the first line, Our Father who art in heaven. We talked about how that really does set the stage not only for Christian prayer, but for our Christian lives. It establishes us. We recognize that we are children of God Most High. That we are not only creatures that have the image of God, but we are actually children of God. God our Heavenly Father, God our Heavenly Mother, God our Heavenly Parent. We actually have the spiritual DNA of God in our very souls. And not only our souls, but it's also in the souls of every person that we encounter everywhere. We are God's children, and therefore we can call upon God always for forgiveness and strength and love and mercy and direction in our lives. Now we look at the second line. Um, there are two parts of it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And I'm indebted to the uh, insights of Martin Luther, our spiritual ancestor, who wrote a lot about the Lord's Prayer because he looked at this uh, as really the most important prayer um, in all of Christendom. It's helpful to know the way that Martin Luther understood Scripture. It's brilliant. His brilliant insight is that all of God's Scripture acts upon us in certain ways. It acts, us, it acts upon us as law and it acts upon us as gospel. And it does this simultaneously, that acting as God's law, scripture and God's word condemns us. It laws us. And as God's law, it judges us. It shows us for who we are. It shatters our self-image. It, it breaks down our defenses. It shatters our pride and drives us right to our knees where we can do nothing except pray to God for forgiveness, for renewal, for strength, for wholeness. And that's where God's gospel comes in. The law condemns us. God's gospel then lifts us up and makes us righteous. Now, in describing the Lord's Prayer, uh, Martin Luther, in his treatise, um, described what righteousness was. Let me read it for you. He says, Righteousness is nothing else than for someone being brought to know oneself to ask and to seek grace and help from God by which that person is lifted up by God. So God's righteousness shows us who we are in order that we might therefore ask God to lift us up. In the second line of the Lord's Prayer, we see this. Thy kingdom come, 
Well, first of all, we acknowledge it condemns us, it judges us because we acknowledge and we confess that we don't live in the kingdom of God, that God's kingdom is not part of who we are, but we desire to, to have God's kingdom. We desire God's kingdom to come to us. What is God's kingdom? Well, some people believe, well, that means that when we die, we go to heaven. And yeah, that's, that's true, but it's not the entire truth of God's kingdom. Jesus told us that God's kingdom is all around us and God's kingdom is within us. We enter into God's kingdom whenever we put God at the very center of our lives and all the other concerns of our lives revolve around God as God at the center. We enter into God's kingdom when we align our lives with God's holy purposes. And when we are in God's kingdom, when we have that alignment, we have God at the very center, then we are living in, in God's holiness. We are walking in God's holiness and we are living right. So to say, thy kingdom come, what we're saying is, I need it to come to me because I'm not there. But I want it. I want God's kingdom to come to me. And I even acknowledge that I can't come to God's kingdom, that God's kingdom is God's mercy and grace and gift to me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. When I say thy will be done, I recognize that I don't live by God's will. I live by my own will. And that's what a sinful nature is. Not that we do bad things, but that our will is what drives our lives and drives our decisions and, and makes us, uh, and governs how we encounter the world. It's not God's will, it's our own will. Because we hear God's scripture calling us and telling us what the ideal is and we're not going there. God says, love your enemies and treat well those people who do you wrong. And we say, I'm not gonna love my enemies. I hate those people, those sons of guns. And I'm not gonna do right by them. I'm not gonna do nice to them. I'm gonna get them back for this bad stuff that they do to me. God says, or God's word says, give generously to the poor, give sacrificially. And we say, I'm not gonna give sacrificially. I'm gonna give whatever's left over after I've bought my house, bought my vacation those of us who are, have means, and some people don't have means. But for those of us who do have more than enough, we say, well, I'll give God, I'll give generously to the people of God and the things of God once I've bought my house and my vacation home and once I have my new car, and then after I have my expensive vacation and get my, uh, my expensive clothes, and I live that kind of happy life that I have, then, I, then whatever's left over, I'll, I'll give sacrificially of that. And that's not living according to God's will. That's living according to my will. And being self-willed people really is the origin of all sin. And it goes right back to the Garden of Eden. Because God took Adam and Eve and put them in this paradise and said, you got all you need and you can do whatever you want with one exception. That tree over there, the knowledge of good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you can't eat it. That's it. Well, of course, the deceiver, the snake, the devil comes along and, and uh, uh, fills Eve full of falsehoods. And they go ahead and eat the apple. Because what they're saying essentially is, I don't want God to tell me what to do. I don't want God telling me what's right and wrong. I can decide for myself. I can, I can do this. I'm, I'm capable of doing this. I'm going to be my own my own judge, my own jury, my own convictor. I'm gonna be my own person. And that's one of the big sins that we have in our American culture that we're so uh, individualistic. We wanna decide for ourselves. And we have a lot of, you know, we, we see the results of that all around. So to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, is a confession, it's an acknowledgement that we don't live in God's kingdom and that we don't follow God's will. And as a confession, as a judgment, as God's law, it condemns us and gives us no wiggle room. It drives us to our very knees.
where we can do nothing except raise our eyes to the cross and say, I need you. I need your love. I need your forgiveness. I need you to wash me clean. I want these things in my life. And that's where the gospel comes in. Because God does give us forgiveness and renewal. God does give us guidance and strength to live ever more closely with God's holy purposes. In describing a spiritual journey, John Wesley, who was a reformer of the English church in the 19th century and the one who founded the Methodist movement, which we now see in the United Methodist Church, he had a great phrase that I turn to again and again in my own spiritual walk. He says, as disciples of Christ, we are always moving on to perfection. That in our daily life of repentance and forgiveness, falling on our knees, asking God to help us, we are always moving towards the perfection that God has for us. We may never get there until we get to that afterlife where all things are uh, made new again. But we're moving on towards there, uh, on towards perfection. And that's really a good, good way to look at the spiritual life. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Let it be done in me, Lord. Bring me ever more close. Help me walk ever more uh, towards the perfection that you have for us. Help me as an individual to be the person you want me to be so that I can have the life you want me to have. Help us as God's people gathered at St. Paul's Lutheran Church and around the world to be the people you want us to be so that we can accomplish the mission that God wants us to accomplish. So my brothers and sisters, I hope that this helps to show you some deeper meanings of the Lord's Prayer that when you say it at night, when you say it in the morning, whenever you say it, you might draw nearer to God. May God bless you on your Lenten journey.